Welcome to Facilitating on Purpose, where we explore ideas together about designing and facilitating learning. Join me to get inspired on your journey to becoming and being a great facilitator wherever you work. I'm your host, Beth kugler Blom. Hello, welcome to season three of the podcast. If you're just joining us, welcome. I'm glad you've decided to check out Facilitating on Purpose. If you have been a regular listener with us through season one and two, thanks for coming back. I am so excited to bring season three episodes to you. In this episode, you're going to meet my guest, Yasser Tamer. Yasser is a disability advocate, a researcher, and an accessibility consultant. Yasser is currently pursuing his undergraduate degree in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the American University in Cairo. He has embarked on his facilitation journey through attending what's called the Mid-Year Festival, MyFest, something that I have now been able to be a part of as a participant and have enjoyed learning from all of the varied folks around the world, actually, that facilitate and participate in MyFest. Through a common connection, I was able to meet Yasser and invited him to come on the show. And I'm so pleased that I was able to do that. This conversation that I had with Yasser is all about how we can make caring learning environments for people with disabilities. I think it's an important conversation and a good one. Enjoy the show. Yasser, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to chat about different things, facilitation and learning and, and, uh, you know, disability. I'm more uh, happy to always talk about disability when there's someone who's motivated like me to chat about these things. I'm so motivated and I know that you're going to teach me a lot today and give me food for thought. So let's get right into it and, and get started. Yes. As I think about our conversation today, I just want to know a little bit more about who you are in the world. Who are you, Yasser, in the world? And who are you right now as a facilitator? Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting uh, because I've never thought about facilitation when I was really young. My name is Yasser uh, Tamer. I'm a student. I'm still doing my undergraduate degree here in Cairo at uh, the American University in Cairo in the Department of English and Comparative Literature, and I'm a disability advocate. So that's really my part of my identity is that I do disability work all the time. And I'm advocating always for the rights of people with disabilities in every, uh, you know, context and all the opportunities in the, and in the best way possible that I could do. To answer your question about who am I as a facilitator, I would just say uh, it started for me it was in 2022. I got to know one of my closest friends now, who is Professor Maha Bailey, who is a professor of practice at the American University in Cairo as well. And then she was doing the Mid-Year Festival, part of Equity Unbound, which is a grassroots movement, a community building uh, resource for all educators and, 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 and faculty developers and all people interested in education. And I found my interest in this, and I found myself even more inclined uh, to explore it. And then I got, shortly after I got to know uh, Professor Bailey, I just, it just went that she told me like, oh, there's a video festival. Uh, are you interested to attend? And then I attended, that was in 2022. And when I attended that, it just, I felt like, oh, wow, that's the community I feel like I belong to. And that's the way I want to grow myself. And that's the way I want to see myself developing. That time I was only an attendee, just like everybody else in the room, just like everybody in the community. It just had occurred that I was mostly a person who attended a lot of sessions in the program. And then I took Professor Bailey's class, who, the uh, class at, at, at AUC, the class that she teaches. And part of that is the uh, Sulia Connect program. And Sulia is an organization that uh, does virtual exchange programs for students who are interculturally marginalized, who are uh, placed in different parts of the world and it just connects people from the US and Europe uh, with people from the Middle East and North Africa like myself. Because I was, as I said, I'm, I'm based in Egypt, I'm based in Cairo. I'm um, a person who never traveled abroad. So I took the Surya program. I finished that program and then I took the facilitator training afterwards, you know, in their uh, organization. The facilitator training, I took it because I felt like that 
really resemble my, the, the mid-year festival experience, the MyFest experience. We call it MyFest. And then I took the facilitator training and I found myself really attached to how dialogues can be constructively uh, you know, facilitated and organized and, and, and communicated. Next, my first came, 2023, and uh, I also, I this time I worked as a co-organizer of the pro- whole program, so I facilitated sessions, I led uh, discussions, I, I hosted people, other people's sessions, so I was actually responsible for welcoming participants into the room as a learning space holder. And that's what the intentionally equitable hospitality entailed, which is the facilitation practices that a facilitator is responsible for holding the space that's actually coined by also Professor Bailey and one of the people who are responsible for the program, who are also one of the co-leaders, uh, Mia Zamora, who is also a professor at Keene University. So I tried to imitate, I tried to be intentionally equitable, and uh, I tried to be as mindful as possible with people and uh, with being welcoming, with being included, in, like uh, uh, welcoming uh, in the space with being inclusive of whoever will come to my school. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, my way or my journey into manifestation. And I sort of feel very bad because I just summarize this in one, two minutes, but my feelings towards this journey are really great. It just goes beyond being explained in like two, three, four minutes. I don't mind at all. And I'm happy to hear about the journey because I feel like you got such an excellent start I've heard of Maha Bali. I've heard her speak several times on particularly the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast that Bonnie Stahoviak runs. And uh, I think she's so widely respected in the world for probably many things. But wow, to have her as a collaborator, perhaps as a mentor, as you got started in your facilitation practice, it feels like you're pretty lucky. Nice, uh, nice start to the facilitation world. Do you feel that? I would say I'm pretty lucky. I'm I'm very fortunate to have someone uh, like her with me in this world every day just a learning experience i'm gonna really go back to this later i i I, I know but it's the way that you have something and then develops because you have a wonderful mentor who works to to develop your innate skills in that particular area so facilitation it's just i'm gonna tell you something i'm uh, like Three years ago, I just gave a class presentation and I was really not confident enough to give it. I stuttered. My language skills were very bad. I kept moving back and forth between my slides because I didn't have digital literacy skills. Fast forward to like this, this time, 2024, I look at this and I just feel like, oh, it's just because you have a wonderful mentor. And speaking of Bonnie Stahoviak, it's just also wonderful to... One of my very proud moments was to, that that I was one of her guests on a podcast. It just when she sent me, I felt very proud that oh wow, just coming on one of the prominent teaching at, at podcast. Same as when I got this invitation to be on this in this on this podcast as well. It just feels so surreal to get to know people and to feel that what you're doing is recognized and that you're not only doing it for yourself as a person to develop and to learn. But you're holding an intentional space. You're you're emerging as not only a person, but you're you're emerging as a person who who aspires to change something in the world and to be intentionally equitable. Absolutely. And I saw that you were on Bonnie's podcast when I was researching you before we you know had this conversation, and I was on it as well. So we have that in common. But I do want to recognize that you have so much experience already that you're bringing to this practice because of your background in equity, disability, and inclusion and the lived experience that you bring to this work as well. Would you share a little bit more about you yourself and the skills and abilities that you bring as Yasser, the facilitator? Actually, just a disclaimer, which I actually forgot to mention, is that I'm a totally blind person. I was born blind. I became blind due to a a medical issue that happened uh, when I was really a newborn. And then it was this way that I never uh, saw something from that world, which gets me to your question, actually. So I am um, um, the skills that I always feel like I want to bring into a facilitation practice is that you want to always apply an emergent 
strategy slash intentional adaptation into your facilitation. So what does this mean? What this means to me is that you, we all we all go to spaces. We all recognize some barriers that might occur last minute into our facilitation. But being blind is it just when 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 we come to the room as facilitators, and then you find a blind person coming in as a participant, you start panicking. You start feeling the world is so bad that the session will not go smoothly because. It's the, how can I just handle this person? How can I, and by the way, it happens in the learning environments. Just one, one, one particular time, I can recall a professor who said, oh, how can I deal with you? So this is my goal. It's just in facilitation, which is what I convey that I'm no different uh, as, a, as a person, but maybe I'm different with my disability, but my disability has been imposed by the society because it was imposed by the society Let's together work. Let's work together to eradicate it and to try to make it inclusive and to try to start on this journey to make me welcomed and make me feel that there is no such inequality in your space. So I hope that answered your question about what I I bring. I bring all the skills that everybody brings actually. So whatever everybody is required to be, everybody is required to be warm. So that's one of the key elements in facilitation, right? I try to be warm. I try to be motivated. I try to be inspired by what people's thoughts are. I try to be creative. I try to be critical thinker. I try to be intellectually ready to meet whatever the world is, is bringing. And then that's the sort of skills that I would focus on. But my asset is always about how to recognize the disability community when they are attending your space or when they are coming to your space. Yes, you mentioned the fear that maybe we have as instructors or facilitators of learning when we realize that there is going to be someone in our classroom or in the room that has a disability and maybe we're not prepared for that. I mean, I hope that we can get to a point where when we learn that we've already prepared for that and we just say to ourselves, okay, that's okay they can participate fully in the thing that I've designed and planned to teach here or this experience I want to facilitate. So I don't think we're there yet, but we're working towards that. And this is part of the the biggest part of your work or some of it? Very much so. Um, we are not yet there and we will never be there because we can't be 100% inclusive, but we can do the, the very basic stuff to be. And then the golden rule was that the advice that I always give to people is that always ask, always ask, ask people whatever they need, ask people what do they need from you to make their life more easier. If you, if you ask and you end up feeling you kind of can't understand, just ask again. Or if you researched and you feel like, okay, you did, you did the very basic one stuff, but then the basic stuff are not really optimal for the person who is who's or, or different in your space, ask. And when you ask, they will tell you what they need. And then when you, they do what you do, what they need. So you're 100% inclusive for them. You're 100% inclusive for them. But you might not be 100% inclusive for me. If I have Beth in my podcast and ask Beth, okay, what do you need Beth from me? And then she said, oh, uh, I just need closed captioning enabled because I'm a hard of hearing person. Okay, I enabled hard uh, closed captioning for Beth. But if X would come to me then afterwards and says, uh, this is not inclusive, although I, I've enabled closed captioning from last time, still, you haven't known their needs. You haven't known what the person needs from you to be, uh, you know, included from you. And this is our role is always to serve the community the way they want us to serve them and not to assume you know, not to assume things that we 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 carry from our, from previous experiences. I hope that's understandable. I hope I, I, I conveyed my point. Absolutely, and the word assumptions was coming up in my mind, and then you said, "Don't assume." And so I think that's a great learning for us all that we can think we know what the person needs, and maybe we do something to prepare, but we. We will never know because everybody is an individual, aren't they? So what I think a person needs is it could be what they need, but it might not be. And that's really important to find out. Yes. But if I'm designing 
a workshop or a course and I don't have access to a person or I just want to design inclusively so that everyone can come and participate in the experience I'm facilitating, what are some of the things that you want us to think about when we're in that design stage so that we can be inclusive? I designed courses at my universities. I worked with the Center for Learning and Teaching team to design courses for both faculty and, and, and teaching assistants. The thing that I myself look into is that who is going to, who is who, who who my audience are, who are my audience. And then if I don't know my audience, or if I'm, I'm creating something that is sort of open for the world, then again, I just go ahead and do the access, the most well-known accessibility requirements. So that, that let's give this example. In facilitation, we as facilitators sometimes have handouts. This is this right? Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, or or visuals of some kind. Well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna elaborate on visuals later, but we have handouts here. The idea of you have a Google Slides, you have whatever. The handouts will always include visuals. Or will not, depending on your time. So what, what what do you need to do? You need, for example, to do alternative text. That's the very basic. For someone who's blind, is just to do alternative text for them so their screen readers can recognize the, 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 the visual that you're including. If you have a document, you have to go ahead and use headings. You have to use hyperlinks and label the hyperlinks as clearly as possible instead of like saying, click here. So what is this here? What is this here talking about? Like, if you tell me click on this video, so I know, I know that this link is a video. If you have a, a document, then you have to make sure that you, you, you're you using a sans serif font so so everybody will not be irritated by your font. Every, it's, it's just visually comfy for them. So the way that they see it goes well with the, with the site. So color contrast, font, accessible font, Color contrast is like, okay, you use a good color that is comfortable for the eye. It both applies to slides and docs and, and, and all that. In the actual facilitation of an activity, and that's something that happens a lot of times. And you're sharing the screen on Zoom or whatever platform that you're hosting on, you start feeling, you start saying, this points out to XXXXX. So what is this? Like for a blind person who cannot see the screen, they cannot really see what is this. Or if you're showing a, a photo and then they say, like, uh, I'm showing a photo on the screen. Uh, if you guys can look at the photo and then let, tell me XX. And then, then you deprive the person with visual impairment to know, to, know, to know what is in the photo. So perhaps you have to just say, okay, this photo, which is an, uh, an XXXXXXX, full description, and then you now gave the description orally to the person. Or perhaps you can just, if you have a handout, you just include the description of the handout for the person. Or sometimes it's always helpful to include it in the chat. Why? Because, okay, if the person who is blind, is fine. They heard the description, but then we have another person who has a mental disability and they can't retain memory. So now set the description, but the person really cannot really grasp because their memory is pretty short, then if you include it in the chat, it's there. They will have they can look at it whenever they want, however they want. They can even take notes, they can even take the chat message copy and then keep annotating. You know, it's always helpful to keep it la like like lasting for such for, for a long time and, and not deprive people of the Deaf community, and this really have happened to to me personally. Um, in a session, I just, we were just facilitating the session. We were just dealing with the people who are attending the session as normally as possible. We were just describing an activity, but we found out that a person who is in the at the participants is deaf. We didn't have closed captioning on. We didn't know that she's deaf. So what could we have done at that time is that either we lose or we lose, but we didn't, thankfully. What we did is that we kept adding things in the chat. By doing so, applied something called intentional adaptation, which Priya Parker talks about it in her book, The Art of Gathering. And then we intentionally adapted the session to suit her needs 
to meet her learning goals and to be able to at least welcome her the, the way we can in the best way possible. I like the idea of using the chat even more intentionally than I might be doing myself, even because I've talked about this before in different ways, but we have chat post documents that we create where we pre-plan all of the chat posts that we want to go in there, right? Like activities, instructions, and all that kind of stuff. It's always upsetting when people turn off the chat in their meeting. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And, but you're just making me think, okay, well, if I showed a photo, yes, I'm going to describe it verbally, but I also can pre-plan that I put a description of that photo in the chat. It just kind of ups the game a little bit from what I've even been doing to make more information go into the chat to be helpful. It's either you do a pre-plan, either you keep, you write, you improvise and write it at the moment. You know why? Because sometimes, sometimes people say diff very different things very different things and then it can inspire your, your description it doesn't matter what matters most is that you know that you have to include it in the chat and sometimes by the way the chat doesn't stop at the uh, at the chat doesn't really you know function when 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 dealing with photos you know when you when you describe an activity you can also include it in the chat when you for example liberating structures and you have liberating structures and you say okay uh, we're describing the following activity, which would take X and uh, the activity entails X and um, you will do X. Why not include like bullet points in the chat so people also can, who doesn't really, even people, let's forget about disability, people who have weak language skills, who accents are very different, difficult for them so they can read it. So the chat is always wonderful. A handout is always wonderful if you're not comfortable with the chat. A handout is always wonderful to include. Yeah. And I liked how you brought up the memory retention piece because putting things in the chat, how many times have we experienced that the group goes into the breakout room and people go, what are we supposed to be doing again? Yes. <laughs> so they have it there. It's in the chat. They know they don't have to have held that in their mind yeah. for so long. And while screen readers often pronounce the chat at the time it's being sent, and this might also overlap with the voice of the facilitator, it's always advisable that the facilitator just, just stops talking for like a second or two until the chat is done or gives pauses, not stop stop. Like if if people if the facilitator recognizes that the chat is really is is going is going so quickly, it's just going on it's just on fire. They can just do two things: you can just give pauses, give pauses and do nothing, or just act as the reader says. I'm just going to read the chat out loud. So just in case someone is driving or someone is not able to read. That's a wonderful way for, for facilitators to get out of this dilemma and then say, okay, I'm going to read out the, some of the things that came in the chat to just see what people had said. In case someone is driving or someone can, cannot read it, so I'm going to read some of this. That's wonderful. Let me think about how this works practically. So you're using a screen reader yourself to participate in an online workshop, right? Or, yes. or facilitate one. And so you're listening to what's going on in the chat through your screen reader. And so yes, the fact and... that the facilitator is talking and the screen reader is talking to you, that is probably a little bit distressing sometimes. There's a lot going on. So yeah, we, ha we have it to help is. you out there. Yeah, it <laughs> is. I'm, I actually sometimes go out of sessions with with a very bad headache I think because of this I three voices are talking my in my head the facilitator the screen reader and my phone screen reader it's, it's a very important thing because sometimes I have to use phone to take notes to sometimes open Mentimeter to sometimes open the doc, the slides if we're doing a slido three four different things to talk in, in just a few minutes of, of, of the session and then you have to handle this on your own yeah. Thanks for bringing up that extra device because you're right. People will say, here, pull out your phones. We're going to do a Mentimeter. And just to be conscious that that's a lot of devices that are now talking to a person or or even just to engage with if you are a sighted person. That's a lot, isn't it? And we need space. It's another argument for putting more space and silence, maybe in learning spaces as well. Yes. Now, you talk a lot, I think, about caring for people. So put your facilitator hat on now as you're as the facilitator and you're crafting this caring learning environment for people. What does that mean to you? You talk about hospitality in learning spaces as well. So what does it mean to foster care and hospitality in learning spaces? Maybe things you haven't said yet. 
I actually wrote um, an article for the Mind Brain Education magazine. Hi, so Heather Kretschmer, who was also an English uh, teacher, uh, works in Germany. She invited me to write this piece. And I actually drew on the intentionally equitable hospitality uh, by uh, Dr. Rabali and Dr. Zamora. I drew on Verna Rossi's book, Inclusive Learning Design. And she says one of the things that she brings up is, in, is she, she divides inclusion or inclusive into an acronym, which is intentionally equitable, co-creating, liberating, user-friendly, socially responsible, integrative, and value-based and ecological. And, and I think these nine values are the representative of CARES. I just need to credit it again to Dr. Uh, Verna Rossi, who works in the UK, who is a learning uh, designer. She's the author of the Inclusive Learning Design book. But for me, to if, if I could reflect on these points, is that all these points I've tried integrate, at least integrating them into my practice or receiving them as part of something or as a part of a caring environment that I was in. Um, for example, I took a class on literature and cinema, and uh, I'm not that person who can watch films, you know, even if they are packed up with audio descriptions. And I took that class because, honestly, I took it because I loved the professor. I learned a lot from the professor. I just took it because I loved the syllabus, I loved the variety. But mind all that, she just, the, the, the movie, the films were all uh, not audio described digitally. But the way we handled it is that she acted as the audio describer. We used to sit together in class beside each other, and then she used to describe all the scenes while they were, you know, screened. And this is sort of how the intentionally equitable, she was intentionally equitable. She also, she let me co-create the class with her. So in case there was something very hard, and in the class, she let me, okay, let's co-create this together to uh, be inclusive for the whole class and for you as well. And by the way, the element of co-creation was went above and beyond, even with with Dr. Bailey, because wor the work that I co-designed courses with her and her team from the Center for Learning and Teaching is just the way of co-creation that she we co I co-create with them as a student, as a person with lived experience in disability, and as a person with values that are related to disability. Uh, I think socially responsible also contributes to this, that I'm socially responsible for these marginalized people that I want to bring my experience for, like in order to benefit them as much as possible. And so this is how I think, uh, in, 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 in summary, as, as much as I could recall, the, the inclusion means to me when it comes to being a, a person who crafts, I, I just think of, those descriptions or criteria in which I think inclusion would be would be done. It's actually not the the it's not, it's not everything, but at least that's how we can we can work with it. You know, I love that you speak so much about co-creating, and it makes me think about dismantling power structures. And you know, because you can have a professor and have a student, and that could be very hierarchical, and they don't work together to craft the learning experience together. But you're telling me stories of the opposite, that you have been drawing in and been drawn in to create with your faculty. And, you know, now they're probably friends and colleagues. And it's just it is so equitable so uh what's the word uh, equalizing or balancing out of yeah. of experience and expertise yeah it's actually equalizing it's drawing on the most needed at the moment so i actually feel like it's also the element of co-creation is even between students together so what i really wish to do is that i wouldn't stop at this point i i just wish to create something where i i even pay the favor back to the whole world and then why not like establish something that I can co-create with with people from different parts of the world that could benefit or help the disability community that can, that I can do I can believe in people like what what like how people believed in me it's like I've I've had people who championed me who believed in my dreams who who didn't take my experiences for granted so um the element of co-creating is not always momentum, you know, it's just 
it's just for the future as well. Is that why, how can I take this element above and beyond and co-create with people in order to keep the, the passion and the vibe going? I do see that as perhaps a strength of yours, you know, not knowing you very well, Yasser, we've just met, you know, it's our second time meeting and talking with each other. But in looking at what you put out in the world, it does seem clear to me that you really care about sharing your expertise and well, these things that are you're helping to co-create, you're you're really intent on sharing them out widely so that other people can benefit from them. Is, is does that seem like it describes you? Yeah, very much so. It's just sharing, it's just keeping the loop going. It's just as it it wouldn't be only Dr. Bailey or her team. It wouldn't be only my other friends who helped me. It wouldn't be only me who even contributes to the to the field or to the momentum of of disability inclusion or the you know hopefully going to be something that is that is developing and and imagined and reimagined and defined and redefined in ways that hold everybody accountable and hold everybody responsible to take the to take the whole vibe more and and keep it going it's just if I end up being in this world uh, for a few years doing things until I die and then, yeah, I, and then the, the the passion is not shared, the element of co-creation is not shared. So I, th that's too bad. And I don't really hope for this to happen. I don't aspire for this to happen. I just hope that there will be a lot more who can continue on and on and on co-creating believing in people caring for them caring for their needs including them and welcoming them in their in their, in their spaces you know mm -hmm. I think you talk a lot about communities and you're you've been talking a lot about it but not actually saying the word community but you've perhaps received the support of a community around you but you're contributing to that community as well for sure can you say something about just the importance of communities and for all of us as we learn about inclusion and try to do more effective work in this way for someone to recognize the value and significance of community in their lives i think ask yourself who are the people with with whom i feel i always feel a strong bond towards uh, i hope i'm framing the question right but i'm actually thinking about it in the sense of who are those that I always tend to feel very close and without any reservations and boundaries, I feel like everything melts down to being comfortable and being very open and free, liberating and 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 rejuvenating, if I can put if I can use this word. That's the element of community for me. It's just with different parts of the people of 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 different people from different parts of the world. But then I feel like that's the presence makes me happy this is the community for me i like being for example with people who are from the same community physical community i mean from the same uh, country and the element of love for the community is not really there so that's not a community i i, I wouldn't really say that's a community mm, that's a nice way to say it and you talk about being comfortable makes me think to ask you, okay, so if you and I were going to facilitate something together and we hadn't worked together yet, how could I make you feel comfortable working with me? And and what would you do to make me comfortable working with you? Like, what does that look like as we begin to develop our community together? Honestly, I wouldn't talk about me as a person as yesterday because it's, I, I tend to, uh, to, to adapt with people easily. And I feel like I'm, I'm that person who can open up easily. I'm that person who's really comfortable to share things even with strangers whom I don't know. I can just talk about everything and really everything. I'm not that closed off. But I would say if I'm facilitating something with a disabled person, but I don't know them, I, I will probably try to first examine closely what, from my interactions with them how they deal with the world, how they like to talk, how they like to do conversations, and then ask them, because I'm, I'm, I repeated the word ask a lot, but it's really the key with everything. 
it's it's actually the key even in physical health that when we meet a disabled person in the streets struggling we always advise against going and grabbing them surprisingly we always tell them ask don't grab this is something that done by amy kavanaugh uh it's, it used to be a big campaign on twitter x well, twitter formerly x now and then um she used to advocate for the rights of women even through this campaign because she used to say like okay i'm not really uh i shouldn't be prone to harassment as a as a visually impaired woman as a disabled woman uh by being grabbed out of the motivation to help me go ahead and ask me first what what do i need and then the same the same concept could apply to facilitation the same concept could apply to basically everything is that don't assume but just ask what mistakes do you think i might make with maybe good intentions in working with you like making an assumption about something are there common things that we should be on the lookout for and just stop doing i i would i wouldn't really be personal with this question as well i i would say some people tend to be more offended by some language so reviewing the language element is really important some people like those in the us for example like people with disabilities and disabled people disabled people is more favored in the uk because they say that the the disability is ahead of us because of the society the disability is created by the society which is the social model of disability Unlike the U.S., they say, okay, we, we, we value our disabilities, so our people with disabilities. And then this is the, the language element. So sometimes the language element makes a huge sort of gap when we interact with people who are quote-unquote different slash quote-unquote disabled. But in terms of facilitation, I think not involving Disabled people in the design would be a huge mistake, believing that they cannot really contribute or it would be too much for them, that they cannot really handle work or tasks or whatever. I think also that's a huge mistake is that, okay, when we design, we often have to anticipate who is involved in the design. And when and then we know that we have a person with disability, so then we have to go ahead and involve them and giving them the space. Okay, we don't have to also go back and assume that they can't facilitate. Basically, it's just their presence and then they are present and then their presence will make it. No, they can do whatever they want. You just have to make sure that everything for them is will work smoothly, that they, they have the accessible tools to facilitate, that the workshop content is accessible for them. Because sometimes when we exclude them from the design slash facilitation process, it will turn out to be inaccessible. It will turn out to be fully instead of beneficial, it will turn out to be ineffective, I can put it that way. Yes, exactly. You've shared so many great suggestions. I want to talk about activities. So when we're designing workshops or courses, what do you want us to think about to make inclusive activities? It just depends on what we are facilitating, but accessibility would be the heart of ideas when we create activities. It's that we have to create it accessible. We have to make sure that it's accessible. We have to make sure that we're doing something that would not be really presenter-centered or facilitator centered, but rather this is not really disability related, but this is something that I would really be concerned with. It's that if I'm creating something, I would make sure that it's not facilitator centered, but rather participant centered, where the word of the participants are very important and they are actually one of the core tenets of the session. If I'm just speaking as a facilitator without hearing people, it, it wouldn't be too effective and it wouldn't be too welcomed and it, 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 it feels so bad. It feels so uh, disconnecting and disconcerting for, 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 for the attendees. I talk a lot about that too. And I sometimes call it uh, or ask the question, where does the content come from? You know, does it have to come from, we wouldn't even really say facilitator in that experience, would we? We'd probably just say lecturer or presenter or something, but how do we design so that all people are included and we really hear more from the people in the room rather than the person standing up in front of it or leading it? Maybe in the word included w wouldn't really be restrictive for disability people only, it just including pretty much everybody. That's right, yeah. And we'd also liberate ourselves to be more welcoming for other things, such as, for example, you know, we would say people are welcome to eat when they are 
in the session. People are welcome to go off camera in the session. People are welcome to bring their own kids in the session. So it wouldn't be like, okay, like it's, it's so bad and it's not working well and kids are going. So why not, why not excluding kids from the session? People are welcome to bring elders. So some people are taking care of their elderly parents or are taking care of their elderly grandparents or such. Why not excluding those? So why not including them instead? Why not designing our content to adapt to those who are different, but they still want it to be there because they want to learn, but they have some things to respond to in life? Why do we always assume that everybody should be in front of the camera in their office, opening their camera, wearing uh, very formal clothes, suits and stuff? No, if you, if you want to attend my sessions in bed, you're welcome to attend in bed and you're welcome to go off camera. You're welcome to leave without asking to, for an excuse. You're welcome to say, uh, I'm not, I'm, if the session is like two hours or more, uh, you're welcome to say, okay, I'm going to leave by the hour. If I'm creating breakout rooms, so I, as a facilitator, feel it's important to create an, 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 a quiet room for people. That's something I've learned from Equity Unbound and from a lot of a lot of facilitators in, in Equity Unbound would, would do this. That, okay, we they create the, including Dr. Bali as well, they, they actually create a quiet room for, for people who are not in the mood to talk. That's basically it, you know, uh, someone who's really not, not in the mood to talk to participants or partake in a specific activity or something like this, someone who's deaf and they cannot really say it on the note, you know, someone who is driving a car and they still care to attend, someone who's in a public space and they cannot really open their, uh, you know, mic and talk, someone who's not a good speaker of the language in which the session is held. But they still wanted to listen because they believe that this will improve their language skills, which is important, by the way. It's the listening, improved listening skills. That's something we always know. But if we put them on the spot and let them talk, no, I, I wouldn't think that's a good idea. I'm so glad you mentioned all those different things and there are so many more of them, but it helps all of us remember, all the people listening to this episode, remember that this thing that we want that is inclusive learning spaces. It's not just about ability or disability, is it? It's about circumstance. It's about context. It's about, yeah, feeling how you feel that day. Um, the technology you have, there's so many elements within. It's it's just not a disability thing, is it? It's not a disability thing, but because, you know, the word inclusion is an umbrella term. Uh, when we say now inclusion, it doesn't really signal only disability. It signals a lot of things. It signals people who are minorities, people who are black, like Muslim minorities in Europe slash the global West, Christian minorities in the global East. And then, uh, okay, we what do we need from the world then? Is that we would recognize where the inequality is situated and then try to, as much as possible, eliminate it by make an inclusive environment. I was really uh, keen on talking about this idea of inclusion uh, when you asked the previous question, because it's not, I just wanted to emphasize that it's not only about disability. It's just every everything else that works along this, alongside this, this narrative. But I just mentioned these examples to make sure that, you know, uh, try to make the space for people to attend without you imposing on them different restrictions. That's right. That they can show up as who they are with their whole selves, whatever that is. With their whole selves, with their guests, with their kids, with their parents. For example, a mother who's watching her child studying. Why do we have to deprive her from attending because she's just watching her child? It just it doesn't make any sort of sense. That's an example. And many more are, are, are there that we... If we can speak about this, I think you and I can just record, I think, uh, many episodes about this ideas of, of wrong practices and facilitations and, and, and all that. Yeah. And we're sort of judging things based on some sort of paradigm that's been put in our head from long ago or from our culture, wherever we're coming from. There's certain, you know, do's and don'ts that we think we have to adhere to. And it's wrong, isn't it? A lot of them from those the days of yore. <laughs> yes, it's wrong. But actually, I would like to always acknowledge the 
challenge that the facilitators themselves meet because the, there are a lot of cha- or encounter there are a lot of challenges that are really hard to go along and then one of them for example is that if someone is disrupting the flow of the community how the facilitator would act are they gonna disconnect them from the community just protect the whole people or are they gonna shun them and i think it just stems from being intentionally equitable as the idea of in order to make it say a safe space, as I said, and as Dr. Bani and Zamora put it, in order to make it a safe space for all participants, I think it's it's important to part of the safety that you create is to eliminate all the harms that come uh, across your space. That's also a challenge: is that you need to protect your your space, and if you fail to protect it, the space will be dangerous and then people will not by the time feel it's safe anymore for 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 them to share their insights absolutely so it's really you mentioned well being welcoming before but i think you've also mentioned in other spaces it's about belonging and you just said safety there's that's our ultimate goal isn't it that all learners feel that and we we try to create that when we design and facilitate and sometimes we'll fail but we keep learning how to do it don't we Yes, it's an ultimate goal to be learning and it's an ultimate goal to belong. And speaking of belonging, actually, I would just recall the book Belong, How to Find People by Radha Agrawal. Um, uh, it's called Belong by Radha Agrawal. And then this book talks about energy, that we bring a lot of energies to the spaces in which we inhabit and which we at, that we attend. And I think that if we create the wholesome space or the space that is inclusive i think it helps people bring their own energy in as much way as possible and in as widely as possible and in as the most way comfortable as possible i think to put it that way is that we help people bring their own energies and moods into the the conversation that feels like a lovely place to start what you just said there. And I want to thank you for having this conversation with me today and sharing a lot of your own experience and the learning that you've done so far in this field, but also what you've brought to it as well. Thank you so much, Yasser, for, for chatting with me today. I just want to thank you for giving me the space uh, to talk and to just try to help put some... <laughs> The, of these points in this podcast and to make it clear that we're all learning and we're all trying to be inclusive but there has to be the efforts and the intention to be and i just want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity that you know you believed in my you know sort of little experience and to draw on them in this podcast that feels so much power and and I'm 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 feeling loved and I'm so grateful for the opportunity and I would just like to thank you again for 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 having me today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Your experience doesn't feel little to me. So, I just want to say say that, right? It feels very big and very important. So, it's been wonderful to learn from you today. Thank you so much and uh, I really wish you all the best and I, uh, what I truly wish is that this this episode would help someone you know, change their attitude, behavior, values, beliefs. If if it even makes someone smile, I would be really happy about that. I would be really feeling that I did my job, that I changed someone's even mood. I love that. It made me smile. Absolutely. And and you've helped really ground me and propel me forward too in this in my thinking around this topic. It's been great. Thank you. As I look back on my conversation with Yasser and think about all of the things that he taught me during our conversation, I'm really struck by all of the resources that he mentioned throughout the conversation. I just want to remind you that in the show notes, I always put the resources that are mentioned in the episode in the show notes. You can see those hopefully through the app that you're using to listen to the podcast or going to facilitatingonpurpose.com where I have show notes for every episode and the transcripts as well. So go and check out all those resources and those great books that Yasser mentioned in this episode. 
A couple of things I want to reflect back to you that were things that Yasser said. One of the things was the phrase he used about how his disability has been imposed by the society. I don't think we often think about a disability being imposed by society, such as how Yasser phrased it. I'm so appreciative of the way he said that and just highlighting that for me. He said, I want to convey that I'm not different as a person, but maybe I'm different with my disability but my disability has been imposed by the society. Because it was imposed by the society, let's work together to eradicate it and to try to make it inclusive and to try to start on this journey to make me welcomed and make me feel that there is no such inequality in your space. Oh, that's such a great thing that Yasser said. I mean, everything he said was great, but I think it's just an overarching, wonderful statement to say, this is something that society has given us all to figure out what to do about. So people can come to learning experiences, no matter what's going on for them, a disability in a physical way or something else that is present for them in their life. And how do we just keep trying to make every learning experience inclusive for everyone? On a related note, of course, Yasser just kept reminding me, you heard him do it, that every single person is an individual. And so even though we might know someone who is blind, we might know someone who is deaf or hard of hearing or have something else that they're going through life with, just because we've met some person with whatever that circumstance is, doesn't mean that the strategies that will work for the next person with perhaps the same situation, it doesn't mean they're gonna work, does it? So every time, we need to check in with the particular person or group that we're working with and just say, please tell me, you know, tell me what you need, you particular person or you as a group, and uh, how can we keep doing this thing we call learning or providing learning or creating learning spaces just that much better all the time. It's very iterative, isn't it? As we continue to learn and grow in our facilitation practices and in our learning design practices around being able to prepare for and then facilitate experiences. So thanks again, Yasser, for reminding me and all of us around the individuality that exists with disability and beyond. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Fernando Murray and Carolina Almeida. Fernando and Carolina and I have a great conversation about a topic that will be wonderful to listen to right after this one. It's on safe learning spaces. I know both Fernando and Carolina through the Liberating Structures community here in British Columbia. They are both seasoned facilitators and I can't wait to share this conversation with you. Catch us next time on the show. We will see you then. Thank you for listening to Facilitating on Purpose. If you were inspired by something in this episode, please share it with a friend or a colleague to help them expand their facilitation practice too. To find the show notes, give me feedback or submit ideas for future episodes, visit facilitatingonpurpose.com. Special thanks to Mary Chan at Organized Sound Productions for producing this episode. Happy facilitating. <laughs>